ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this espresso style brief seminar with the former president of South Africa, F.W. de Klerk. I just want you to know that the reason why I've been able to bring the former president onto this call with you is that I'm a member of the International Council of the Global Leadership Foundation which does uh, extraordinary work completely behind the scenes. And if I may say, I've had the extraordinary opportunity to witness President F.W. de Klerk. He is somebody, he's an Afrikaner. He doesn't believe in talk, he believes in actions. And that's not something that he's said, it's something that I've seen. And so I'm going to ask you our first question, Mr. President, which is, if you were in a room at the beginning of this year, with uh, uh, Donald Trump, and you had to tell him how to feel and think, what might you have said? And uh, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. If I was part of his team, I would told him to shut up. If I was running against him, I would have very firmly said that what he is doing and was doing was totally unacceptable for a United States president and that firm action against him is justified. And, and if I may just follow up with, with that, I guess, do you think you would have expected a good response? Do you think that maybe the people around him were not saying that? And have you said that without naming names to any other world leaders? I, I personally think that these people did not say it to him. Those who dared to do that were immediately fired by him. He had in Rex Tillerman, for instance, a very good uh, Secretary of State. When Rex Tillerman didn't take everything lying down, he fired him. And he did so with a number of other people. So yes, I think there were a few who tried to, but they were silenced immediately by him. What was the other part about other world leaders? No, well, I'll, I'll follow up with it uh, with one more question before I go straight to Jenga Rapu, who's got a question for you, which is that I, I still try and imagine those days uh, before South Africa moved to majority rule, and I imagine close associates of yours coming and giving you a very harsh dressing down for potentially taking the country in the wrong direction, and you would have had to uh, address their concerns, but still move on with what you decided to do. And I'm always curious to know how on earth you did that. Well, the big challenge was to keep my team together. And whatever I did was done internally in a democratic way. I regularly uh, discussed all the details with my cabinet. I had a negotiating team. They always reported back to cabinet. And in cabinet, we argued about things. There were some people who disagreed with certain things, who agreed with other things. And we always sorted it out and reached a consensus. So I could always rely on my inner circle supporting me, not because I told them to do so wagging my finger, but because they had their opportunity to influence the decisions and felt that they were sufficiently consulted before I took my final decisions. And thank you so much. That's, that's the way to, to, to govern a company and a, a board of directors, and that's the way to govern a cabinet. I, I, I just think that I, I feel so extraordinarily fortunate. I don't think you realize this, Mr. President, because I think it just become, comes inherently and naturally to you. It doesn't come inherently and naturally, for example, to the former president of the United States. And actually, I would say that when you spend a time around real leaders, you learn how to do it. But we're not gonna go into what I wanna talk about. I'm now going to allow uh, Dr. Jangir Apu to ask your question. Go ahead, Jangir. Uh, hello, um, I'm calling in from Calgary, Canada. And uh, first of all, thanks so much uh, to uh, Guy for, uh, for the invite and putting this together and to uh, Mr. DeClerc for spending time uh, with uh, this group. So, uh, you know, when I got this invite, I, I tried to order, uh, order your book, uh, your biography, but it's, uh, 
taken a while to get to get delivered, so I didn't have a chance to to read the book. But as I was thinking about it, I was saying that during the times of uh, you know when you went through, there was massive transition going on in in South Africa. And what's changed in 30 years uh, in terms of how politics is done? And I thought about the fact that we've kind of moved into this age of intelligence today, where knowledge in, in, is- The age of what? Of intelligence, where yeah. it's sort of a fourth industrial revolution, where you have the ability to have large data uh, shared with very widely. And I was wondering about how that affects resolution of international conflict today versus how you dealt with it in, in, in 1990. And, you know, does the use of technology nowadays uh, lead to a different type of Cold War, uh, maybe between China and the US? And sort of just this idea of how technology changes how you approach problems today versus how you approached it in 1990. Well, it was actually to a certain extent the beginning of the refined technology that we see today. So in that sense of the word, it didn't play all that much of an important role. We didn't have Facebook, for instance, already then. We didn't have Twitter then. So I personally never made use of modern technology in the sense of getting my message across, except going on TV, except going on the radio, except holding press conferences and the like. Uh, technology played a role, of course, in gaining intelligence. And we had a very sophisticated uh, intelligence arm. It was necessary for us to know what was going on in the rest of the world. It was necessary for us to maintain good relations with the intelligence services and thus reach other governments to convince them of our good intentions. Uh, but uh, I would say technology wasn't in the 1990s in my time so dominant as it is today throughout the world. So if I could just uh, sort of follow up on that, given as you said, it's now dominant and maybe a lot of people have access to this intelligence. How does that change the way uh, you know countries interact with each other? Uh, the idea of sort of soft skills. Uh, versus uh, hard data, uh, given that there has been a momentous shift in, in, in the world to now, uh, does this advent of technology change the way politics is done in your view? I think so, yes. Specifically for politicians themselves, the way they communicate, the way they reach out, the way they get their message across. They make ample use and, and widespread use of modern technology in that regard. I think also uh, in gaining intelligence, it's playing a role. We saw the, the negative role which Russia tried to play in the American elections, for instance. So there's also the, the negative aggressive side of misusing intelligence in a way which is unacceptable interfering in the affairs of other countries, spreading to use Donald Trump's favorite word, fake news. Uh, that's the negative side of, of modern technology in, 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 in politics and in public affairs. But by and large, public affairs is benefiting from modern technology. And it leads, I think, to better decisions because data is more up to date Data can be double checked, it's more trustworthy, and it makes for better decisions. Um, thank you so much, Jangir, and thank you so much, Mr. President, for your answers. I, we have a number of people who are, um, you know, sort of like more tech enabled and technologiable than I am. I'm going to move to Herman Peterscheck, who not long, until not long ago, worked at a subsidiary of Tencent. He was the third employee of a gaming company. He knows perhaps more about gaming even than my son. And he recently moved to the middle of nowhere where all he has is a good internet connection. Herman, over to you. Thanks, Guy. Um, again, I wanna thank um, uh, former President de Klerk for taking time to talk to us. Um, 
interestingly enough, I was living in Holland in the Netherlands in the 1990s. I went to high school there. So it was interesting to watch uh, everything unfold from Europe instead of the United States. And on that note, um, I spent two years in Hong Kong um, recently during the first umbrella revolution. So I've been following the events there between China and Hong Kong. You, you mentioned about government in, uh, interfering in other people's elections. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on, um, China is sort of accusing the US of interfering in things that uh, are they consider to be domestic policy, which from the American perspective is an issue of, I guess, general morality. Like people should have freedom of speech, they should be allowed to uh, vote and, and so on. And, you know, maybe from another country's perspective of the United States, hey, you guys violate the same rule that you're, you're um, accusing these other countries of doing interfering. So it's not okay for Russia to interfere in the US elections. So China says it's not okay for the US to interfere in our policies. Do you see that as a moral equivalence or do you think there is a right and a wrong? What's your view on that sort of dynamic? I don't think there's a moral equivalence. I think. I think any country has the right to promote the values it stands for. And democratic countries are upset about the undemocratic practices which takes place in countries like China, like Russia, uh, like Hungary nowadays. It has all moved towards a sort of a dictatorship. And dictatorships are from the viewpoint, if you adopt and embrace the values of true democracy, dictatorships are unacceptable. They lead to wrong things. There's never been a war in history between two really democratic countries. This statement was made to me. I questioned it. I tried to check it and I couldn't find a war between real democracies. The wars are between countries or, or are led quite often or instigated quite often by dictatorships, by leaders who go overboard, by leaders who attach, who has to have, to, the egos are too big. So in that sense of the word, I think a country has the right to criticize another country as long as it does so openly and not <clears throat> interfere in its internal affairs in an unacceptable way, by rigging news, by distorting facts or things like that. So in that sense of the word, I don't think it's wrong for a country like the United States or Great Britain or Holland or South Africa to be critical of what takes place in another country. But the way to deal with it then, if you have that criticism, is not the way that Donald, Donald Trump adopted, for instance, to declare an economic war and to take such far-reaching steps without trying the road of dialogue, without trying the road of influencing people, without building alliances with other surrounding countries, Donald Trump damage the alliances which America has in the Southeast Asia, in India, in South Korea, in uh, uh, the other important one is, uh, I just have a senior moment for the moment. So the in the end, what is fu fundamentally important is how that criticism is expressed. In the case of Hong Kong, it's a different case. There was an agreement which was not internationally accepted that Hong Kong would be dealt with in a certain way. And China is diverting from that agreement. China is implementing steps there which militates against the spirit and letter of that agreement when Hong Kong, uh, when, when Great Britain uh, stepped away from Hong Kong. So in that sense of the word, it is an international issue which should be dealt with also in, in forums like the United Nations. Uh, what China is doing in Hong Kong 
is unacceptable in terms of international law and in terms of conventions. I think the China-Africa policy is a manifestation of China's ambitions to become the leading country in the world, to replace the dollar as the strongest and most important currency in the world with their currency, to become the dominant country of the world. They're using Africa extensively. I think for Africa, it's a dangerous policy, although in the short and medium term, Africa is benefiting from it. China is building dams and railways and schools and uh, electricity uh, generation capacity, et cetera, et cetera, throughout Africa. And Africa is a poor continent. And in that sense of the word, Africa is using the available channel to improve their position and their conditions. And, but in the process, they're falling into the trap, becoming the risk of becoming accolades of, of China. And in that sense of the word, I, as an African, although I look like a European, I'm an African in my heart and soul, are deeply concerned about the growing influence of China. Initially, China made one mistake. They brought in too much Chinese labor when they undertook these building and construction programs. And there was a, a, a kickback from Africa in that regard and said, no, we want jobs for our people. China amended its policy in that regard to a certain extent. And now uh, they, they are employing the local people much more when they become in, involved. But it's part of China's expansionist strategy. It's dangerous for Africa in the longer term. And uh, I think it's important that the free world recognize this threat, stop its Africa pessimism, and get involved in Africa, compete, not by dishing out things, but compete in the business field, compete in the investment field with China in Africa. Africa is an awakening giant. It offers so much in the longer term future. It's a very young continent if you look at its population. If you look at its natural resources, it's a rich continent, not only in minerals, but also from an agricultural point of view, if we think about the possibility of food shortages, the solution lies in Africa. And the free world need to get become much more deeply involved in Africa and challenge China in a competitive, open way. I think that Africa could not have a better ambassador than former President de Klerk. I only wish that Africa appointed you as their roving ambassador. It would be it would give extraordinary results. As you speak about agriculture in Africa, I feel compelled, Mr. President, to uh, just recognize my father, who's in a bright orange jacket. He probably will not want to speak, but um, uh, he traveled to South Africa to marry my mother and was a salesperson for seeds. Can I just say to you, your father? Yes. Can I, can I just say to him, Aangename kennis, blij to ontmoet. Did he, did you hear that, Sabah? A kind of big African spot. <laughs> so uh, there you go. Uh, over to you, Terry. Uh, well, thank, you. Guys, thank you for um, arranging uh, the, the Zoom call this morning. And uh, President DeClerc, thank you for <clears throat> your, your time. So my question relates to uh, ra race relations here in, in the U.S. and, you know, parallels between you know, South Africa and the US. And, and let me preface it by saying, I feel like when, when President Obama was elected in 2008, I was hopeful that race relations would, would take a positive turn in, in the US. And, and I feel that uh, in many regards, they went backwards uh, in the US and, uh, and became very much more politicized. Um, and so I just appreciate any any thoughts you have on uh, any, any parallels between the U.S. 
in Africa and uh, what you see for the future in the U.S. as it relates to race relations? There are definitely, I think, many parallels to be drawn, but there's one difference, fundamental difference. In South Africa under apartheid, it was a white, a white minority which held all the reins of power. In America, it's a black minority which has not been sufficiently accommodated according to many spokespersons sufficiently accommodated in their system. So that's the fundamental difference, but the parallels are strong. There was apartheid in America until the 1950s. Blacks didn't have the right to vote in many states. Uh, there was racial discrimination of a serious nature. Likewise, under apartheid, there was racial discrimination. The minority dominated, held all the political reins of power. The Blacks had a vote in their homelands and uh, for sort of decentralized governments, but they could not participate in the politics of the country, the major politics of the country itself. There was apartheid on the basis of, in America and here, on the basis of, of residential areas, who lives where. There were, in America, also black schools and white schools, as there were in South Africa, white schools and black schools. So, yes. But the one important difference is that in America, there was no risk at any stage of the Blacks dominating white Americans. In South Africa, we faced the challenge, looking at the rest of Africa, how do we give full political rights to all South Africans, including all Blacks, without going the way that so many other African states went? And in our case, the Black resistance movements were backed by Russia. And through the South African Communist Party, Russia was funding them, training them militarily and otherwise. There were hundreds of thousands of Cuban troops in Southern Africa, right up to the stage when I became president, promoting the communist cause in Southern Africa. So, when the Berlin Wall fell and when Soviet communism imploded, it opened a window of opportunity for us to bring justice to all South Africans and to negotiate a new constitution based on international principles, based on human rights, based on a vote of equal value for all South Africans. And we jumped through that window of opportunity when it was offered to us. Now the whites are a minority in a country politically dominated by blacks. But our votes count equally, and we are committed in our constitution to a truly non-racial state. Non-racialism is also a challenge for America. But non-racialism is not so easy to reach. I agree with you that I also had hopes when Obama became president that that would improve race relations, but it apparently did not have that effect. Uh, racism is alive and well in the United States. And unfortunately, the present government in South Africa, the African National Congress government, is again promoting racism. I abolished the Race Classification Act to say that you are on your identity document and whenever you have to fill in a form, you're white or you're black or you're colored or you're Indian, I abolish that. We're back in that now in South Africa. The NC government has black economic empowerment as a policy, they call it radical economic transformation. For instance, one example about how they are, have fallen back on racism. They have instituted a system 
of helping with the COVID problems, the tourist tourism sector of our economy. But they said this help will only be available to black owned companies where 51 or more percent of the shares of the company is held by blacks. They won't help the full tourism section. Blatant racism and blatant discrimination. So that's wrong. So yes, they are sorry, I diverted a bit, but yes, there are parallels, but there are also differences. Mr. President, I'm so extraordinarily grateful for all of your um, answers and where our espresso is up, I'm going to uh, close with a last already? question. Already, <laughs> time flies when you're having fun. And the goal yeah. is to respect every time everyone's time here. So we're not going to allow this to go Good. over by- I'll be brief with my yeah, last reply. Elias, the Roman general, uh, he is famous for saying all sorts of things to wise things to his generals. Sorry, he was an emperor. And I, I'm just curious for this group, we, I think that I, I'm, we, I can say for everyone here that we revere you, I revere you. I think that uh, Africa would be a different place if you had not been the leader of South Africa at the time. Uh, and I'm sure that you've had to inspire people who report to you and I thought that you could leave us with words of inspiration for helping us to create a better world the way you did in Africa. I think values are fundamentally important. We must promote the values which have succeeded. The values which built strong economies. The values which prevented war. The values which ensured that the population was properly educated. I think the, the real message which we must bring across is democracy, although it's not a perfect system, is the best system. And we must promote the values and the cornerstones on which democracy is built. This is happening in Africa. More and more African states are becoming more and more attuned to a healthier form of democracy. I believe that dictatorship and fascism and communism are wrong. And I believe in the values on which the success of the free world has been built. It was good to meet all of you, everything of the best. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for inspiring us. Uh, and everyone, if you want to ask me about the GLF and the International Council, it gets the opportunity to have a couple more interactions with uh, not just the former president of South Africa, but other extraordinary people. You can ask me. Thank you so much. Wishing everyone a wonderful day. Goodbye.